what we needed to do in order to create loyalty is build a strong brand. And uh, first of all, come up with a good name. And, and that was an easy, um, seems obvious, immense. It's, it's, why didn't we think of that? But it, that took a long time. And it was my co-founder, Adam, who, who cracked that nut. And then also make that known. And that was, I think, slightly easier because all the pharmacies communicate very similarly. They look the same, they talk the same, and it's all very conservative and green. And uh, it's always a pharmacist in a white coat telling you something uh, very sensible. Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO podcast. I'm Richard Metcalf, founder of X Quadrant. And my mission is to help the world's top CEOs and entrepreneurs shift from incremental to exponential progress and create a huge positive impact on our world. Now, that requires you to reinvent yourself and transform your business. So, if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. As a startup, how do you attack a dominated market which is highly established and where there is a huge incumbent player already very successful? Well, this is the question that I asked Björn Thorngren in this episode. Björn is uh, the CEO of Meds, which is a leading online pharmacy in Sweden. And uh, what has been really impressive about Meds is that over the last uh, five years or so, it's become the fastest growing Swedish company. It's had 800,000 customers in just six years. 50% of the Swedish population recognize the brand. And in this conversation, we get into understanding how Björn, first of all, identified that this was a market ripe for disruption. And then secondly, how did he build consumer preference for his small little company in the face of such huge competition from the established monopoly? So this is a really fascinating conversation about what it takes to enter and attack and succeed in new markets. So enjoy this conversation with Björn Thorngren. Björn, hello and welcome to the show. Hi, Richard, and thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, what I know about you is that you are the CEO and co-founder of Meds, which is a leading online pharmacy in Sweden. And I think you've been the fastest growing company uh, in Sweden over the 2018, 2021 period, according to the Financial Times. Uh, you've from that, from founding the company in 2018, you've grown to 800,000 customers and your brand is now recognized by 50% of the Swedish population. So what makes this even more impressive, I would say, is that this is a market that's really dominated, right, by I think pretty much a single government player. So it's a market which it wasn't like it was a highly fragmented market and you just had to find a little, a little extra, you know, tiny sliver of market share to thrive, you literally had to go in to a big dominated market. And uh, you've been very successful in that. So I'd love in this episode really to dive into that story and what made you so successful. Um, let me start with the first question though, is that I, what I understand is that you don't believe in, um, in entrepreneurs having to create exciting new markets. Uh, and you think a more boring approach might actually be more successful. So do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, successful and also not necessarily more boring either. <laughs> so you can create fantastic companies in existing markets by marginal improvement in that market. And it's still a, a huge challenge. Uh, you just you get to focus on the customer experience rather than having to educate the whole market that this new ex solution or product uh, exists. So uh, really, it's, it's a learning uh, from my previous work life as an investor and advisor in within m a a lot of companies struggle with that they spend so much time and energy in in building the product or service and they don't have uh, the resources to then also create uh, demand and and in the end uh, fail so it, it to me it's it's a lot more uh challenging to to really have this tailwind helping you along and if we do things right we know things will go right so it's all up to us we eliminate the external challenges that are really are very hard to control yeah that reminds me of that kind of framework of you know you've got new markets and new customers and 
or you know new offerings and new customers or old offerings and old customers and uh, it sounds like what you're saying is perhaps a lot of entrepreneurs start by thinking well i've not got any customers so i'm going to have to build a customer base and also i need to kind of create a new product um and actually doing both of those is quite hard right as you said introducing something new to a whole bunch of new people is a real challenge yeah and, and also the the first mover advantage which largely is a myth there's a great advantage to to not having to uh, really break away a lot of barriers from regulators uh, or, or whatever and instead really have someone else do the tough part and then come in and, and build a really solid company and if the market is big there's room for more than one yeah absolutely yeah, there's so much effort is, it? yeah, as you said, the pioneer has to do a lot of digging, breaking down the frontier. Uh, really interesting. Great. Well, let's kind of jump in. So this was a situation where you were, you said, okay, um, so back in whenever it was, 2017, 2018, you had this idea to enter this saturated, mature market uh, in terms of uh, the pharmacy market. So what was the What's the driver behind that? What made you kind of go, go all in on that idea and decide you wanted to dedicate the next few years of your life building that business? It is a fascinating market. It's one of the oldest in the world from the Middle Ages, and it's grown every year since. So it's very stable, non-cyclical. Uh, yet in Sweden, we have done a fantastic journey because the idea, uh, my idea was really around the year 2000, but back then, Along with North Korea, Sweden had a state monopoly for pharmacy. And there was only one pharmacy called the pharmacy. Uh, and that led to uh, a, a very poor customer experience. So we have still today very few pharmacies per capita, low or limited opening hours, limited number of products, uh, high prices, etc. So then when I came back from having lived in, in, in London and, and worked in tech, I realize now it's certainly possible around 2016 because it deregulated in 2010. And all of a sudden, from having been the worst market in the world, became really the best to create a new business. The regulation was really favorable uh, compared to many other countries uh, where there are a lot of limitations on what you can do, how you can raise capital, and if you can even open a pharmacy. Um, and especially for online, since it was a monopoly. There was only this state company uh, talking to one state regulator, and they came really far in terms of e-prescription, which is now 100% uh, of all prescriptions. And so we had the regulatory and the technology to really create a brand new company selling prescribed medicine online. Uh, and that's what we decided to, uh, to do. And, and like you alluded to in the beginning, uh, we had very strong competitors because this state-owned retail chain Remain and was joined by the largest supermarket uh, in, in this country, also creating competing retail chain, which is actually slightly larger now. So we have very strong competitors, but it's also a huge market, 6 billion euros in, in little Sweden alone with 10 million inhabitants. So in difference to many other high growth companies, we do not need to immediately go abroad to a new market, bigger markets. We can create a, a really big company in our own market. And then eventually as other markets mature, because we are now the leading market globally for online prescription, we can move there. But as a solid company and, and with actually the focus and, and resources to enter a new market rather than having to do multiple markets with a really young and, and already stretched organization, which I've seen uh, a lot of other companies having to do pushed by their VC investors to create this 10x return in, in just a number of years. We're, we're moving slower, but still fast. As you mentioned, we're the fastest growing company in Sweden. So it, it is another way to build a great company. It takes maybe slightly longer, but also a lot less risk. Yeah, that's great. So. What I heard there is you had a lot of a lot of data there about the the, the market. The regulation had changed. Uh, there were new players coming in uh, and so forth. What came first? Like, did you did somebody just randomly tell you about the fact the regulation had changed? Were you like looking for? Were you kind of like systematically looking at sectors to identify a favourable regime or favourable opportunity? 
uh, you know, did, did it, was it a personal experience where you found this is so terrible? What can I do about it? And then, so kind of how did you realize that all the conditions were aligned for you to disrupt this market? Yeah, it, that's a great question. It wasn't the first uh, and obvious idea. I, I was also looking into, along with some others, to start a ETF, a, a traded fund for Bitcoin for a while. And we realized the regulation wasn't there yet. So we put that idea to the side, which was in hindsight, a great idea, not until this January, actually, some, some real ETFs came out. So it did take a lot of, of time. And then I started looking for other really big established markets, uh, which were in some sort of a change. And, and this market was it's the second biggest retail market underserved both in terms of bricks and mortar, but especially online, it's the perfect product to sell online, yet only a few percent were sold online back then. So huge market, uh, recently deregulated and in the middle of a change from store to online, uh, uh, to me, it was a perfect market to start something new. Uh, the challenge I found was that it's a really complex market. There's a lot of regulation and, uh, it's a, com a lot of complexity in how you enter the market to get all the supplier, uh, to sell to you and not the least how you build a brand to compete with the pharmacy, which is ingrained over 40 years monopoly in people's minds. Yeah. Well, well, let's talk about that. So this is what we talked about, right? Attacking a dominated market. So when you said, okay, there's room for change, there's, right, there's room for innovation in this market. We can see we can make things better in the customer experience. And yet it's dominated. There's this one brand, there's government control, there's regulation. Like, what was, how did you approach, how did you attack the market, right? What was, say the key, are there two or three key principles that you had to really follow in order to build a successful business that perhaps some of your competitors didn't do as well, looking back? Yeah, it, it wasn't an, an obvious uh, approach. We had to attack multiple angles. And really when we talked to advertisers and uh, agencies, they wanted to find a really strong USP, something that made our business totally different uh, to the existing. That's what they're used to. And that's a whole lot easier to market, obviously. But we're re reselling products and in the end we can differentiate somewhat. We're, we're not going to be totally different to what's out there. Uh, so what we did was we, we focused really on the mobile experience and we talked about being the mobile pharmacy. So uh, that was kind of new seven years ago. It's not as new today, uh, but obviously 80% of customers use their mobile and most experiences back then and still today, I think is not always optimized for the mobile customer. So that was one thing. And, and then we also innovated in terms of customer experience. We had extended our customer service. We had really fast delivery, one to two hours in, in Stockholm in the early days. Now we do same day in most of the country, which is still very good. Uh, so others have followed in many ways. So uh, it, it's, it's uh, we still think we have a better customer experience, but it's not. Uh, no, a leap, uh, leap of difference. So rather, we we try to build a, a strong preference to to use meds in terms of you have a good experience. Uh, we we really make sure to deliver on our promises, and we take care of you if something goes wrong. And we do still have slightly uh, higher service level, better product assortment. We're not price leading because uh, because that's a, a really a death trap. We have good prices and we have much lower prices than the stores, but that's not that shouldn't be the number one reason to to shop at Med. So, what we needed to do in order to create loyalty is build a strong brand and uh, first of all come up with a good name and and that was an easy um, seems obvious. Med is, is why didn't we think of that? But it, that took a long time and it was my co-founder Adam who who cracked that nut. And then also make that known. And that was, I think, slightly easier because all the pharmacies communicate very similarly. They look the same, they talk the same, and it's all very conservative and green. And uh, it's always a pharmacist in a white coat telling you something uh, very sensible. We, we said, hey, we run a very serious business here. We follow all the regulations and uh, we're approved by multiple agencies, we can communicate 
uh, in a more uh, modern and, and use, um, use a, a lighter tone. So we hired actually a, a singer, a Eurovision Song Contest winner, Mon Sembelov. And he became our brand ambassador and uh, we, we, our marketing uh, manager at the time, Marika, managed to convince him to actually do a music video about meds, uh, where he, he was riding along naked on a horse. And, and that became obviously super viral. And uh, it, it was the most watched video on, on YouTube in Northern Europe for a while. And, it created headlines and, and just, it just kept going and it was uh, taken up in the political debate. So it was a really good way of like guerrilla warfare. It cost some money, but it didn't cost at all what it would have to create that same awareness in a traditional way. Yeah. I'm, well, to be honest, I'm amazed that you didn't uh, decide to do the naked horse riding yourself, Bjorn. Is that what a CEO should be doing? No. I, I did take some classes as a kid, uh, but I don't think I have the, the same. Um, Song skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so great. So, okay, so a lot of, yeah, you put, uh, injected some fern into what you said. You, you said it, you're completely right. Every pharmacy kind of looks like white with a dab of green, right? It's uh, so kind of changing that up. It reminds me, I, I might have mentioned it to you on one of our previous calls, but uh, I once worked with a electricity reseller who I talked to the CEO and he said, you know, Richard, I don't think I run a utility business. Everybody else, all the investors, all everyone thinks I run a utility business. But I'm just resetting electri electricity. So for me, I'm running an entertainment business because everyone's got to buy their electricity somewhere. So why not make it fun? And so his whole approach was how do we make fun to receive an electricity bill, for example? But how do we make people look forward to that? Yeah, it's a great point. And I think the more of a boring industry, the less or the easier it is to surprise positively and be fun because no one expects it, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, the standards are so low, right? It's, uh, there's so many op opportunities then to kind of get people out of, their, out of their expectations. Okay, so I, let's get back. So, okay, so you're thinking about attacking this market. You know, you decide, okay, we're going to go for this kind of mobile pharmacy idea as a kind of a US, not like a USB, but yeah, like a brand, a distinctive brand, has some clear expectations around customer experience, you know, your digital branding moves. Um, what else was part of the playbook? Because clearly, you know, attacking such a big dominated market is not going to be easy for any player. Um, do you have to do things differently in terms of scale or... Um, or kind of speed of attack or focus certain cities first, or, you know, what was the kind of, uh, how did you kind of decide you were going to get traction, I guess, um, and, and build something that's going to inspire? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, we have to find where the big ones have a weak points or, or, or are less strong, I guess. So working with speed is, is, uh, obvious. They are not fast in any way. And, and it could be. Just bringing in new products, we can do it in a matter of weeks and, and they are getting fast now. back then they would, they had revisions twice a year, maybe where they could bring in a new product. So, and, and innovate product innovation goes faster and faster in, in a TikTok world. So if there's a new skincare brand, we want to be where you find that. And, and the same within sports nutrition or vitamins. Obviously, we cannot do that in prescribed medicine. It's what the doctor prescribes. So we can't do innovate so much on the prescribed medicine side. But the more innovation we can have in the other products, the, the more of a destination we become also for prescribed medicine. It's 77% 70, of all women in Sweden get at least one prescription per year and 66 on average percent of the population. So everyone's uh, our customer. Uh, the older uh, their customers get, the more medicines they have. But uh, it could be uh, from an infant to uh, a 30 year old to uh, we have customers that are 110. So we like to create a wide appeal and, and then find what customer group really is uh, combine the best for us. And we also find that the urban customer is a better customer. So we do sell more in bigger cities and especially Stockholm, 50% of our sales are in Stockholm, uh, with, with surroundings, whereas like 30% of the population live here. 
And we see the same in other cities. They are overrepresented as customers. And that's where we focus our advertising as well. And so we, we, we try to make it easier for ourselves and not convince every single customer. And uh, we, tr we try to find the, the most easy to convert and also the most loyal that's the customer we want to keep. I hope you're enjoying this conversation. This is just a quick interlude to remind you that my book, Making Time for Strategy, is now available. If you want to be less busy and more successful, I highly recommend that you check it out. Why not head over to makingtimeforstrategy.com to find out the details. Now, back to the conversation. I think you also said to me that there was a big question when you started around how much money you needed to raise, or perhaps people were thinking you were trying to raise too much money early on. I think you did a 60 million uh, raise. What was the thinking? Yeah, it was over multiple rounds. So uh, we weren't really sure uh, how fast it would go to, to actually reach critical volumes. Um, what we were uh, actually very correct in is all the KPIs that goes, goes into the order economics. If we look back to a pitch book from 2018 and today, we beat every single KPI. And the one thing we underestimated is uh, how much fixed costs we would need. It's not like we are bloated in any way. We were very cost conscious and we kept it very low, but I think we were too optimistic. Uh, assuming maybe we need two people in marketing and now we're maybe five. It's, it's not, you know, it's not 50, but it's uh, in every single uh, department, I think we're a few more people than we initially thought. And that means the bar to profitability, profitability has been a bit higher. Um, but that said, um, we are now EBITDA positive in, in, in our first quarter here and, and, um, we have sort of reached that bar now, and maybe that took one or two, two years longer, but most other things we, we did, um, project uh, the way it happened. Yeah, it's, it's great. So what's been some of the most difficult points on this journey as you were, you know, you obviously high growth, lots of, you know, lots of things happening all the time what, what, you know, what where were some of the moments where you where you kind of thought oh my word what's going on here <laughs> what well actually the pandemic has been very tough for us and and a lot of people expect the the opposite that this was fantastic and and uh, in some ways it was awareness of online pharmacy and especially amongst the elderly for prescribed medicine went up and so that will help us long term Short term, uh, it was very difficult to align to the sudden shifts in, in demand. All of a sudden, everyone wanted to buy a certain item. And then the next week, no one wanted to buy them. And we had to adjust with staff and, and inventory, um, which was also much more difficult to get. The types of products that were in demand is not what we normally sell, face masks, etc. And they were also very hard to get. So we did lose a lot of money on uh, buying the too much or at too uh, high of a price point and, and then all of a sudden see demand dem vanish overnight uh, which is not the normal case normally we should sell everything we buy and we we have very low inventory in, in, in respect to sales it should just move in and move out and uh, so so the pandemic in itself was very very challenging we we prefer gradual linear growth than this explosive uh, growth followed by uh, a big slump. Um, so apart from that, I, I think also building the brand also, even though we had some successes, it's, it's very, very tough, uh, especially when you reach outside of the, the more urban and, and early adopters uh, to get and the whole, like you mentioned, five out of 10 suites now know the brand. What about the other five? And, and reaching those it's, it's still a lot of challenge. And, and if we want to continue to grow the prescribed medicine side, that, that is necessary because we do have very, very strong brands uh, competing with us. And it's also a, a trust business. Uh, and and uh, to convince someone that shopped all their life at the government monopoly to try something brand new, uh, pink, uh, and maybe our website doesn't look really like what they, they expect. Um, th that that is uh, still something we're working on on how to really make that happen the best way in the coming years. 
Well, what was the most successful thing that got you to the 50% mark? What really worked in that, do you think, of all the things you tried? Yeah, being different. And, and a lot of people like that. They, they uh, like your, your contact at the utility company, they are bored by the alternatives and they see a company coming in, trying something new and delivering a good experience and they want to reward it. So there, there is a large section of, of the population that that type of, of communication really appeals. Uh, whereas others uh, are, are uh, less interested in that and just want to find what they're used to. And uh, it is a low engagement product. Buying pharmacy products, it's not something most people really look forward to. So uh, that section of the audience we have to serve by just being very straightforward and, and easy and get this pain and that, that they have a way and, and, uh, we have to be a bit more segmented and, and personalized in the way we communicate going forward to really appeal to as broad as possible of an audience. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Be different. And, um, I guess it makes, as you were talking, it makes me think, you know, perhaps you can't appeal to everybody. Right. And perhaps, you know, perhaps those 50% who you haven't yet reached, they might be your people, they might not be your people, right? They might not actually be the most happy and um, profitable customers anyway, time will tell. Yeah, we have, we have two really, uh, men is the other part of the population that are hardened because 70% of customers are female and that's why we are pink and a lot of our products are aimed at, uh, at females. Uh, men mostly, especially over say 40, think they know we don't shop at pharmacies yet you know you there are band-aids and uh, vitamins and stuff at home they just magically appear there and it's because the wife typically do that type of, of shopping but online the barrier is lower so how do we reach the 30 percent of of um, male customers and and make sure they also understand that they are pharmacy customers because most people use uh, pharmacy products in one way or another daily and, and so there's no reason they shouldn't shop uh, at us as well. This actually reminds me of Coke, right? Coca-Cola, um, because I, I don't know the detail, but I have this impression that they, you know, they had Diet Coke as a brand. And um, I think they found that men don't like, don't, I don't do diets, you know, whatever, right? And so it was hard for them. And so when they rebrand, well, when they brought out Coke Zero, I remember the adverts, at least in some parts of the world, we're very, very kind of lad focused, you know, very much trying to focus on, on the young guys and how cool it would be to have this zero drink, which is kind of interesting, you know, so this idea that science men do not want to go to area, you know, to brands and, and experiences, which they consider to be feminine, whereas women tend to be, you know, perhaps I'm generalizing, but generally more happier to kind of go the other way, right. And go into areas which be male. Yeah, and it's the same with skincare, for example. So products aim for males typically have words like energizing and refreshing rather than, uh, you know, reducing fine lines, even though they're exactly the same product. Maybe a bit different fragrance, but it's all about the message. Yeah, there might be something there. Interesting. So I know one of the pivotal events um, that happened was one of your co-founders uh, resigned in the business. And I suspect that's always a blow for any business. Do you want to just explain like, well, how... How did you manage through that time? Was that, was that, did it go smoothly or was that, was that like a, a shock from the blue and you had to regroup? What was the story? Yeah, I think it's in, in, in even though it didn't appear at the time, it, but in, in hindsight, pretty natural. Uh, so, uh, she was really important in the early days. She know a lot about, uh, most things we're doing, uh, pharmacists from the beginning, having worked with products. But then as we added experts in each area, uh, it was more and more difficult to really see where can you add uh, value that this person we just hired, you couldn't also do really well. And, and we were relying more and more on experts rather than generalists. And, and really there's only room for, for one and that's the CEO. And, and I was already there <laughs> not knowing that much about anything really, even knowing a little bit about a lot. So. Uh, I think uh, that was one side. And then there was also a, a personal side, uh, going through a divorce, moving back to uh, home city that also, especially pre-COVID, 
made it difficult to see how can you really um, make an impact on this organization not really being there day to day. Um, now that that might have worked better. This was, I think, in 2019 we had that discussion. So, uh, and now she's back with uh, our new venture. So we're, we're, we're still good friends. And, um, and yeah, they, it wasn't, it, there were some tough discussions at the time, but uh, I think we all realized that it was, it was time. So it, would you give any, is there any advice that you have around that when you have a company and you've got co-founders? Is there anything you would advise another generation at this point? Yeah, I think the, the, the natural advice is try to agree as much as possible when you start. And, and that's good in any business relationship. So I, I, I get that sometimes when I negotiate contracts, like, oh, we're such good partners, we'll figure it out. And, and I say, well, we are today. But maybe I change role, you change role, and that's why we have the contract to, to regulate whatever happens when we don't agree in the future. And otherwise, we don't need the contract at all. So I think that's one, one, one thing. And also, uh, it's probably good to also consider uh, personal changes. So, for example, a uh, uh, divorce. Uh, how do you handle the, ch the, the shares at that point? So it actually is not split and because... Um, that person is not adding value to the business yet will become a, a major shareholder. Is, is that in anyone's interest really? And I think that's something that we in hindsight could have uh, regulated. Yeah. It's hard, isn't it? At the beginning, you don't want to think through all those kind of uh, less favorable scenarios, right? When you're getting going, but uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. But it could be useful. Great. Well, so Bjorn, what would it like, what's it look like from, for meds? to multiply its impact over the next few years. Obviously you've already achieved an awful lot. You've got a 50% penetration. Like what, what would make the next three or four years extraordinary for, for the business? In many ways, it's just beginning now. So when I talk internally, I say we reach cruising altitude, like for an airline, it, it was, uh, you need their, 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 their afterburner to get up to 10,000 meters. And, and then, uh, then you can go wherever really. And that's what we have now. We're reaching um, break even on a cash flow basis. We have the brand, we have the logistics platform, we have the IT platform. We can do a lot more. So now the big question is, what do we do with all of this that we created, investing so much in? Of course, we can just continue doing what we're doing and we'll probably uh, also go well, but it's not going to be that sort of a rocket ship that we're, we're used to internally. Uh, and so there are ways to to build on this, and one way is to increase uh, our private label section to control more of that side of the business, for example. And then, of course, we can go into new markets, either nationally uh, adjacent markets or internationally. So those are some of the questions we're thinking about now on on how what's the vision for the company in five ten years. It's kind of obvious what we're going to do in the next twelve months, but People and investors and, and myself, I think, also need a longer-term vision that we haven't really set yet. But there are some exciting choices to be made. Yeah, that's exciting. And, and for you, um, Bjorn, as the leader, what might need to shift in you for, the business, for you and the business to multiply your impact? Because often, you know, uh, the way that we operate, there's always a next level in that that's going to perhaps, perhaps open up a new level of success or, or, or impact. So what comes to your mind? What, what would be a shift that you might need to make over the next couple of years? Yeah, I think I have to make the same shift as other leaders in the organization. And in terms of building a team that can do more of what you're doing today and then sort of enable us to be more strategic and, and look forward. Uh, so, and also, so we're not dependent on any single person. And, and that's something we talked about a lot since the beginning. Like there should be a, a fallback for every IT system and also a fallback for every, uh, every person, even though, uh, everyone's happy and loyal, uh, you can get hit by a bus or, or something can happen personally, or you find something fantastic in Australia that you want to pursue. So the company cannot come crashing down if that happens. That's one way. And, and also, if you've done something for a long time, you're not going to do it with the same passion. So find someone that can do that part with a great passion and then build on what you 
learn and, and, and do something else that adds more value with, with your skill set. So that, that's the, true for me as well. I'm, I'm building more and more of a, a self-reliant leadership team, uh, which enables me to start looking at new markets or, or opportunities as well for the company. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, perfect. It's a it's a common thing. I think it's probably why I wrote my book at some point, which was you know making time for strategy because perhaps the number one thing, right, holding leaders back is the fact that they're doing last year's tasks and not next year's tasks, and uh, uh, especially when, and, and it's also a way to motivate the whole organization because we're not like a big company where you can find a leadership role in some other team or or constantly grow. So the only way for a person to grow is if your current boss is moving on as well in some way, not necessarily by title, but at least what they're doing. And then you can take on you. And that's something to learn and look forward to. And no one wants to do the same thing year after year after year. Yeah, well, that's a beautiful place perhaps to wrap it up. Um, to be honest, it's been a great conversation. I really enjoyed kind of looking at, you know, your whole mindset of like scanning the market for where are these industries that are ripe for disruption or innovation, the way that you kind of tuned in the preference, you know, consumer preference, you know, how you found differentiation in a reselling market, how you branded around that. Yeah. Some of the highs and lows on that journey, the, you know, the pandemic throwing, throwing things askew in terms of unpredictable supply and demand, uh, how you navigated, you know, with your, with your co-founders. Uh, yeah, and then the opportunities that are opening up for you, which sound uh, really exciting. So thank you for sharing some of this story. If people want to find out more about you or about the business, kind of where do they go? Well, I think my LinkedIn is is a good place to uh, to start, and I try to be quite active. Sometimes it might be a bit local for some, but you just ignore that if you're if you're not Swedish, um, and eventually there will be something that you know applies to your uh, interest and and uh, geography as well. And, and other than that, it's, it's, um, the pharmacy market is global and a lot of what's happening in Sweden will happen in other countries. Uh, so uh, there's room for many entrepreneurs around the world in, in, in that market. And there are many other markets as well. Like uh, we were talking about wall paint the other day, which actually had a small venture going. Very conservative, huge market, defense market. Like there's so many traditional markets that are right for some level of disruption. It, it doesn't have to be a, a huge difference, but if you can find some uh, something that needs to be improved there, and and there's a, a very good opportunity around. Perfect. Thank you so much. Hey, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Look forward to following on as you uh, you, you expand, you diversify, and all the other exciting things we talked about. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye now. Bye bye. Well, that's a wrap. If you received value from this conversation, please do leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd deeply appreciate it. And if you'd like to check out the show notes from this episode, head to xquadrant.com slash podcast, where you'll find all the details. Now, finally, when you're in top leadership, who supports and challenges you at a deep level to help you multiply your impact? Discover more about the different ways we can support you at xquadrant.com.